Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for a special Ask the Experts Facebook Live for Head and Neck Cancer Awareness Week. We have two Moffitt experts from our Head and Neck Clinic here today to answer all of your questions and share the latest on this topic. Joining me are Dr. George Yang, radiation oncologist, as well as Dr. Krupa Patel, surgeon here in our Head and Neck Clinic. Thank you both so much for being here. Uh, before we get underway, just a few quick reminders for our audience. Please submit your questions in the comments section and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. And please keep in mind, we cannot offer personal medical advice or make a diagnosis over Facebook. Additionally, Facebook is a public forum, so any comments or questions asked here are visible to the public. Uh, with that underway, we will get to a few of those questions. Dr. Patel, I'll start with you. What are some of the main types of head and neck cancers? Uh, thanks for uh, joining us, uh, everybody, and thanks for the introduction, Pat. Um, majority of the head and neck cancers are squamous cell carcinomas uh, that arise in the lining uh, of the mouth, the back of the throat, uh, the throat itself, uh, or the waste box, uh, and the upper part of the uh, air digestive tract. Now, there are some other ones that uh, can also arise in the nose and the sinus cavities, as well as the salivary glands or the spit glands on uh, the sides of the cheek and underneath uh, the tongue and underneath our jawbone. So um, there's a wide spectrum of it and some can be related to viruses and others uh, can be related to other risk factors, including smoking and drinking. And Dr. Yang, I'll, I'll ask you, what are some of the symptoms uh, folks should be on the lookout for when it comes to head and neck cancer? Hey, Pat, thanks for having us. So I think the most common symptom is having a lump on the neck, something that kind of comes along over a few weeks. Most people associate it with having a cold or, you know, allergies and the lump persists. Um, they usually get it checked out in that fashion. Other things that can happen is folks can have throat pain, difficulty swallowing. They can have changes in their voice. Their voice can be hoarse. Um, they can be a little bit more froggy. Um, and the pain can manifest as ear pain, you know, throat pain, a persistent sore throat. Um, those are probably the most common ways that we see patients present. And uh, speaking of things to be on the lookout for, we actually have a free head and neck screening this Friday coming up at Moffitt. Um, what can folks expect if, if they want to get checked out for a screening? Uh, it's a very multidisciplinary team. A lot of our clinic members uh, are actively involved. Um, we do this every year in April. Uh, it's very well attended. Um, uh, and it's it's a it's a great way uh, to get uh, for folks to have their oral cavity uh, checked out. Uh, speaking of that, we also have uh, a few community events uh, throughout the course of the year, and uh, that are also um, uh, 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 free screening events, including at the Bucks games, at the St. Uh, St. Pete uh, Grand Prix, uh, to name a few. That's right. Yeah, along with our, our free skin cancer screenings as part of our the mobile patrol program. And uh, for those interested, you it, it's no no cost to you. you. Don't need to bring any of your insurance information. Um, if we find something suspicious during a screening, what are some of the next steps? Uh, th then uh, certainly the the uh, we would set you up to see one of our clinicians uh, and then uh, start with the the workup of. Um, uh, the suspicious findings, which can include first a thorough clinical exam and then additional imaging if required. Fantastic information. Uh, and if you're just joining us a minute or two late here, we have Moffitt's head and neck specialist here today answering your questions about head and neck cancers. Uh, it is Head and Neck Cancer Awareness Week, and we've got some questions coming in from the audience. Uh, the first question is, what kind of immunotherapies are available for head and neck cancers? Uh, Dr. Yang, I'll, I'll give that one to you. Sure. So immunotherapy is something that's typically prescribed by a medical oncologist. And so Dr. Patel is a surgeon. I'm a radiation oncologist. And the current FDA approval for immunotherapy is for patients who have incurable disease. Um, typically, the one we see most commonly used is pembrolizumab. The trade name for this, uh, some folks may have seen, is Keytruda. Um, there's also nivolumab and some other agents, but in general, these are these are medications that are reserved for patients that have um, cancer that's come back to or, or has spread to multiple sites, um, not usually used upfront. And can you just describe a little more what is involved with the clinical trials process? How how does someone get on one of those? 
Sure. So the clinical trials uh, kind of ran, runs the gamut of, of a number of things. So we have trials that include patients that are first diagnosed, um, all the way up to patients who have you know, fewer options, and we're looking at more kind of cutting edge therapies. Um, but in general, if a patient is thought to be eligible for a clinical trial, we have them meet with one of our clinical trial coordinators to see which you know, trial they would be most eligible for. And that's usually um, a process that the physicians that are treating the patient is going to be um, a big part of. Um, patients, you know, we have a number of clinical trials run through both the head and neck department as well as concurrently through the radiation oncology department. It just depends on the situation. Dr. Patel, you seem like you wanted to jump in there. Anything to add? <laughs> no, uh, Dr. Yang summarized it very well. I was just going to uh, uh, add that, you know, clinical trials uh, can be a great way uh, to get access to cutting-edge treatments uh, that are around the corner. And so, um, you know, a lot of times folks think that there's experimental treatments going on. That's partly true, but th th really it's the, the, the cutting-edge uh, trials that are being offered and, and, and providing uh, excellent care. And our team here, um, starting from uh, you know, radiation oncology, surgeons, and medical oncology, we really work together as a team in identifying uh, which trials the patient is going to best benefit from potentially um, and do it in a coordinated fashion. All right. And we've got uh, two more questions coming from the audience. Both want to know about HPV. Um, so what, what do we know about the connection between HPV and head and neck cancers? Uh, HPV is certainly a risk factor uh, and um, uh, for head and neck cancers, uh, specifically the oropharynx or the cancers that arise from the tonsils or back of the throat. Uh, they typically tend to have uh, better prognosis, meaning the cure rates are better. And um, uh, in terms of uh, its uh, incidence, uh, it is becoming more prevalent. Uh, as uh, the years are going by uh, compared to cervical cancer, which uh, for the most part is stable or decreasing, which is another cancer that is HPV related. Um, there are multiple risk factors with HPV related uh, cancers as well. Um, Dr. Yang can probably speak better to some of the treatment options uh, uh, as well. Well, Dr. Yang, I'll, I'll give you the floor. Sure. So for HPV-related cancers, um, at least at Moffitt, we, we tend to go with a more radiation-centered uh, route, um, primarily because of mostly functional outcomes. But in general, um, for any head and neck cancer, typically, you know, treatment options include surgery alone, surgery plus radiation, surgery plus chemotherapy radiation, or radiation alone, radiation plus chemotherapy. And that's kind of the curative options. Um, HPV, you know, typically we'll, we'll see with treating with either just radiation alone or a combination of radiation plus chemotherapy. I, I will add, um, you know, one, one important thing that we all can do better is um, uh, age group vaccination. And so these are uh, widely available now. I think the age group is up to uh, 40 years old. And so uh, they, they don't cure the cancer but they can reduce the risk of cancer going forward. We, we've seen a, a rise, maybe not a rise, but uh, more cases mentioned in the news. Someone like Val Kilmer stands out uh, as you know someone notable who was diagnosed recently. Is, is there a rise in these kind of cancers or do we just hear about it more when it's, when it's someone, someone like him who, who was diagnosed with it? You're absolutely right. I think that there is a increased incidence. In fact, another name that comes to mind that's high profile is Martina Navratilova, and uh, you know she she also had uh, uh, I believe it was an HP related uh, cancer, um, and so there is certainly a increased incidence and prevalence of HP related cancers, um, and that's again one of the reasons why HP vaccination is critically important in reducing the risk going forward. Um, I might be putting you both on the spot a little bit here as, as this is pretty recently in the news, but one of the abstracts that came out of the, the AACR conference going on talked about the uh, reduced awareness. Um, people, people don't seem to know as much 
that HPV is linked to some of these cancers. Um, cervical cancer was mentioned specifically, but uh, you know, I think that their study found that folks just don't know as much about HPV and it's linked to cancer. What, you know, what does the community need to know about that, that link? Yeah, I think uh, that was just in the past day or so that I think was presented and it, they used a uh, uh, U.S. sort of national, um, uh, 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 nationally wide sample database. Hints uh, was the database that they used to study this question. And it, frankly, it was a little bit more surprising to me when I read that abstract and the study, um, partly because, um, you know, HP vaccination and has been in place for uh, a number of years uh, or a decade and longer. And there have been significant efforts in trying to increase that uptake in the general population. And so uh, the fact that folks are now, uh, or general population is not drawing that connection was a little bit of a surprise. And so as a healthcare community, I think we all need to do better, uh, both as a specialist, but also, uh, you know, probably in the primary care setting as well. All right. Uh, looks like I couldn't sneak one past you there after all. Um, yeah. Got a few more questions coming in from the Facebook audience. Uh, viewer Patty asks, are there health disparities with head and neck cancers? Uh, Dr. Yang, I'll, I'll let you take that one. Sure. I think, um, you know, just like many other cancer diagnoses, um, folks who have lesser access to transport, adequate nutrition, um, you know, getting getting diagnosed early are definitely barriers to, you know, achieving the same outcomes we want to see in all economic classes when it comes to head and neck cancers. Um, I think, you know, the community outreach programs that look are looking at smoking cessation, HPV, you know, HPV um, vaccination are all valuable resources that stretch across the socioeconomic climbs. Um, and, and so are really, really important in terms of getting the word out and making sure people are aware of when to see a doctor, when to, you know, seek out a specialist, and so on and so forth. We've got a, a question from our audience actually related to radiation, so I'll, I'll stick with you, Dr. Yang. Uh, viewer Sarah asks, there are a lot of vital structures around the head and neck area. How do you avoid damage to these when treating with radiation? So that's a really good question, Sarah. So radiation has come a very long ways compared to how it was done, you know, many years ago. Nowadays, someone like myself would typically draw out all the normal structures. This includes all the salivary glands, the spinal cord, the jawbone, the voice box, the thyroid gland. The list kind of goes on and on. And we use very specialized um, computer software to help shape the radiation to avoid these structures to the best of our ability. So our ability to avoid long-term and short-term side effects has, you know, become a lot more enhanced compared to how we used to do things. Um, similarly, other more advanced treatment technologies have come on board, and we we at Moffitt here are trying to utilize these to the best of our ability. Dr. Patel, um, sort of the same theme from a surgical perspective. Um, what what type of side effects are there from surgeries, or how do we how do we avoid damaging some of those structures? Yeah, I, you know, there there are different approaches um, depending on which structures uh, uh, the tumor, the cancers arise from. Um, uh, in uh, For cancers that are in oral cavity or oral tongue or the jawbone, uh, as a group here, we excel in reconstructive procedures uh, that can, uh, they don't completely uh, reduce the risk of uh, side effects, but they can minimize uh, uh, the risk of side effects and allow for optimal um, functional and cosmetic uh, results. So meaning our goals are uh, for functional is to uh, in, uh, to preserve speech and to preserve swallowing uh, and eating by mouth. Uh, for cosmetic purposes, we want to ensure that uh, we can have the near normal facial appearance as best as we can, even after these uh, quite extensive reconstructive procedures. And so the group at Moffitt here um, with uh, myself and my partners is uh, well-trained and we, we do a high volume of uh, these cases uh, to improve outcomes. The second part is that we do use minimally invasive techniques, again, depending on where the, the cancer is. So for example, for cancers of the tonsil or the back of the tongue, base of tongue, we do have uh, ability to use uh, 
transoral robotic surgery for uh, for uh, for to reduce the morbidity and the functional uh, to improve functional outcomes. For cancers of the voice box, we occasionally will use laser, uh, for example, which again can uh, preserve the voice function. And then for cancers of the nasal cavity or the nose and the sinus cavities, uh, we can use what's called endoscopic surgery, which again uh, is a technique for minimally invasive surgery to preserve the external appearance of somebody's face. Um, so we've got lots of tools at our disposal. Every patient and every cancer type is somewhat different and what we can opt for. Great information. Uh, great questions from our audience. Please keep them coming. Uh, if you're just joining us, we have Moffitt's head and neck specialist here today answering your questions uh, for head and neck cancer awareness week. So be sure to post your comments uh, in or questions in the, the comments section below. Um, I recently spoke with with one of our wonderful Moffitt patients. Uh, a gentleman had a reconstructive surgery on his palate and said that he had to work to rehabilitate his speech and his swallowing. And I think I upset some of our speech pathology friends because I said work with physical therapists. So I would love to take this opportunity to show some flowers to the wonderful speech pathologists in our Moffitt world. Um, what kind of role do they play in helping our patients rehab from, from their surgeries? Uh, you know, it, again, it, it, it's a critical part. Uh, uh, really, uh, and uh, Dr. Yang can comment as well, but we, we have a really strong multidisciplinary team and that includes, you know, the speech pathologists and the physiotherapists and the dietitians uh, that are critically important for uh, some of the great successes uh, that we have with our patients. Um, that any patient, whether they undergo surgery or radiation or radiation or chemotherapy, uh, at some point in time will need uh, help with their uh, rehabilitation with speech and with lymphedema and with some of their activities and with uh, managing their weight during treatment and after treatment. Uh, so um, for those, our allied health colleagues are critically important in uh, what we can achieve uh, as good outcomes. So you, right. you are not that far off path, you know, physiotherapists are involved in, uh, in the care of our patients too. Oh, I got a few emails, so I just wanted to make sure that uh, the speech pathologists of the world feel, feel like they're getting their due. Uh, Dr. Yang, were, were you going to add something? Yeah, and to kind of piggyback off of that, um, the unsung heroes of the radiation oncology side, you know, we have radiation physicists, radiation therapists, radiation dosimetrists. Um, these are all folks that help me as a radiation oncologist develop and execute uh, the highest quality and safest radiation plans um, that we can, you know, we can come by. And for the most part, you know, they never, you know, other than the therapist, they don't really ever meet these patients. So, you know, I want to give them their credit when it's due. I appreciate that. Uh, my, gotta... my usual saying goes, you know, we're as strong as our weakest link, and uh, it's a team-based approach, uh, even in the operating room, uh, right from the start. And, you know, I think that kind of goes back to why folks should consider Moffitt in the first place, is that multidisciplinary approach that we have, right? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, we do have some more questions from the audience coming in. Uh, Sarah has another one. Uh, how is quality of life impacted during treatment and afterward? Dr. Yang, I'll give you that one. Sure. So, you know, during radiation treatment itself, there are expected side effects. Uh, usually these things are dry mouth, sore throat, skin changes, um, and they typically intensify towards the end of the treatment. Um, but because we're doing such a good job in terms of trying to avoid those normal structures, you know, there is a very, very reasonable return to quality of life after the treatment is done. Of course, our you know primary priority after the treatment is making sure the cancer is gone, but certainly a very close second is maintaining you know the ability to taste, the ability to have saliva, um, to not have you know significant skin changes, hair loss, so on and so forth. Uh, so we we pay very, very close attention and see our patients in regular follow up to make sure that all concerns as regards to side effects are being addressed and managed in a proper fashion. Fantastic question, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, a few more coming in. One from Jeremy. He asks, are there at-home checks anyone can do uh, examining their own neck, for example, or checking for lumps? What, what can we do at home? Dr. Patel, I'll give you that one. 
Yeah, I, you know, I think uh, the, the key part is a, uh, a neck lump or bump that's not going away uh, after about four to six weeks. Uh, other signs can include uh, pain or uh, lesions uh, or abnormal looking areas in the mouth that are red, really angry looking or white, um, but really, again, not resolving in about four to six weeks. Uh, pain that is uh, persistent or always there and getting wor and, and worsening. Uh, those are the types of signs uh, and symptoms that folks should be look out for, looking out for at home. Uh, oftentimes, I also tell patients that uh, they can take pictures uh, of their map or their loved ones can take pictures uh, of the concerning areas uh, every other day, for example, and see if it changes over time. And if it does, then certainly uh, should, they should see their local um, ENT or a dentist right away um, and seek care. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned seeing your dentist. I feel like a good number of these cases can be caught at the dentist's office. How often do you get a referral from a dentist? And how often were people coming from the dentist not expecting to end up with a cancer diagnosis? Yeah, it's, you know, it's hard to uh, quantify the, the second question that you asked, uh, but uh, both dentists and uh, uh, ENT or, or laryngologist are typically the first point of contact for somebody who's had uh, mouth lesions. Uh, a lot of times folks do get uh, routine dental cleaning and dental checkups which uh, catch some of these uh, lesions. And the earlier they're caught, the, the easier it is to, in some ways, to treat them, depending on the location, of course. Um, but a good uh, routine oral cavity check, even if it's a primary care provider, is important. Got some more questions coming in from Facebook. Another one uh, about HPV. If I haven't been vaccinated for HPV, should I still consider this after a cancer diagnosis? Dr. Yang, I'll let you take that one. So um, typically for patients who have an HPV-related cancer, um, a vaccine at that point is not necessarily going to protect them from the strain that caused their cancer, but it can certainly protect them from other strains of HPV that they may or may not have encountered in the past. Um, for patients who are, you know, below a certain age, I think that the typical cutoff is 40 nowadays. Um, certainly getting an HPV vaccine is still reasonable just to try to be vaccinated against other strains that they may not have, may not have encountered. Um, certainly vaccination is going to be a critical part of the future of head and neck prevention. Um, however, for many patients who are, you know, a little bit older, um, vaccination at this current moment doesn't necessarily affect the present. Um, it, it certainly does affect the future generations, though. I know we talked a lot about HPV today, uh, certainly an important topic, but it's not the only risk factor for these head and neck cancers. Uh, Dr. Patel, what, what are some of the other big, big risk factors folks should be aware of? Uh, for the most part, for uh, head and neck, uh, smoking uh, and alcohol are two big risk factors. Um, not only for uh, cancers, new cancers, but also for uh, the cancer recurrences, meaning successfully getting the cancer treated and then the cancer coming back. Uh, really what one can do is reduce the, their smoking uh, and reduce their alcohol intake over time. Uh, we do understand that, you know, this is a, uh, some folks are, uh, have been smoking lifelong. And so it, it is a challenge. Uh, we actually have a smoking cessation clinic and a nurse uh, that runs that clinic uh, that can see patients in person and uh, as uh, telemedicine visits uh, where they can provide support systems and resources that are available in the community, which can help with it. I think the key point with both of these are that uh, with smoking and alcohol is that one should just continue to try. There, we understand, you know, there there are going to be setbacks and relapses, um, but keep trying uh, is the key, po key point. And how often do, do these cancers spread to other parts of the body? Uh, do we typically see them localized or are they usually somewhere else by the time we see patients walk in our door? For the most part, uh, these are, tend to be localized, meaning they are in the 
site of where they first start, and then uh, usually in the lymph nodes in the neck. Those are the uh, lymph nodes in the neck is a, typically the first place that they will go to before spreading to other parts. Um, so they, they we do uh, see a fair amount of patients that are typically localized or regional uh, cancer, and then distant metastases, meaning anything that goes uh, beyond the neck, meaning the lungs, bones, that uh, can be over time. Genetics uh, is always a hot topic whenever we do these Ask the Experts segments. Uh, Dr. Yang, are there any genetic risk factors folks should be aware of? So head and neck cancers are not um, are not a subsite where there's very kind of classic genetic factors. Uh, certainly, patients who are predisposed, you know, to other cancers, if they have Lee Fraumeni or Lynch syndrome, can certainly develop head and neck cancers. But it's it's not so much um, linked, I would say. Um, certainly, there's some thyroid cancers which are genetically linked, and we'll screen patients for those at a young age or recommend genetics counseling. But for the head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. Um, it's more about the risk factors that we've discussed, you know, HPV, if applicable, alcohol, and tobacco. Uh, you know, in general, we, we always like to tell our folks to just be knowledgeable of their family history. Why is that so important? Either, both, anyone want to take that? Um, yeah, I think it, um, you know, it informs us of certain risk factors to be, you know, to be mindful of. Again, for head and neck, if you know someone has a very strong history of other cancers, we start considering genetics counseling to look for you know age appropriate screening you know, elsewhere in the body. Um, just because one person has a head and neck cancer doesn't mean they're not at risk for breast, colon, you know, it's lung cancers, things like that. So it's always you know a good idea to be upfront with your with your physician about what your family history is, just so they can have a clear understanding of what a individual patient's risk profile may look like. When should someone uh, consider genetic testing, Doctor? So that's that's always a nuanced question. Um, I'll, I'll, I guess I jumped in, in front of Doctor Patel, but oh, it's so, always okay. like one of those things. Go for it. Go for it. You, you have to um, you have to talk with your physician and have a you know have a nuanced conversation about first degree relatives who are affected with cancer. Um, if it's over a certain number, if there's a particular pattern, um, then you know physicians like Doctor Patel and myself. Would, would then consider genetics counselor at least screening. And we do have a very nice genetics department here at Moffitt um, that is always available for at least a conversation. I certainly appreciate uh, the answer. We are just about uh, getting out of time here. Um, I wanna give both of you a chance just to kind of have some final words being the awareness week here for these diseases. What do you think the most important thing or the biggest takeaway you want our audience to remember? Uh, about these head and neck cancers are. Dr. Patel, I'll start with you. Um, I think that we discussed at length some of the symptoms uh, uh, that folks should be on the lookout for. I think uh, both uh, Dr. Yang and myself are passionate about uh, improving lives uh, of our head and neck cancer patients, uh, and so is the team at Moffitt. And really, ultimately, we believe in a team approach uh, and uh, every patient is um, unique, their cancer is unique, and the way we treat um, is based with a patient in mind and not just the cancer. Dr. Yan? Yeah, I think, you know, head and neck cancers are rare. They're, you know, 3% or so of all the cancer diagnoses in the country. And so I think um, going to a place where folks are passionate and specialized and use that really multidisciplinary, multi-pronged approach in terms of, you know, personalizing the therapy is, is really important. And I do think results in better outcomes, both in terms of, you know, cancer survival, as well as certainly, you know, just as important, you know, long-term outcomes, avoiding unnecessary or long-term side effects. All right. Well, thank you to both of our panelists for answering these questions. And thank you to everyone in our audience. For joining us today. For more information on head and neck cancers, prevention, and screening, please visit our website, moffitt.org.